Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thanks for being here with us today. Um, I'm excited to tell you uh, a bit about my research and some of the ventures I'm involved in, and really uh, looking forward, as you could see by the title, into the future of what we might expect and what we might hope from technology. I just want to begin with an observation about human performance and really about optimizing human performance. And there's no domain that we have seen anything like this in the world of physical fitness where there's this global almost obsession with optimal performance. And if you look across every aspect from strength, endurance, balance, speed, flexibility, coordination, you can find specialized programs, equipment, practitioners, all devoted to optimizing these human physical fitness abilities. Really begging the question, what about the human brain? What are we doing to optimize those core functions that really most define us as human? Our memory, attention, perception, emotional regulation, decision making, and at the highest level, compassion and wisdom. And I'd say in this regard, we're really tragically lacking. When it comes to boosting cognition in young, developing minds, that might fall into the category that we would think of as education. But there we've seen almost a completely siloed approach to transferring information content, but not building the underlying information processing systems that that relies upon. When it comes to maintaining cognition in healthy adults, that would fall into the category of wellness, where we've seen this marginalization to everything being alternative, but not mainstream. And in my world, the world of neurology, psychiatry, when it comes to boosting cognition in those of us that have deficits, we really find that there are multiple hurdles that we have not overcome. And I just want to step through those pretty quickly. The first is that we use very poor assessments. So all the advances in functional brain imaging that exist in the laboratory haven't really converted into the clinical domain. If you go into a doctor's office because something is wrong with your attention or memory or thinking in some way, we don't actually know what's going on in your brain that really brought you there. But of course, that doesn't prevent us from treating you. Uh, the problem is that we have relied almost exclusively on this treatment. And there's nothing inherently wrong with using small molecules to boost cognition. But for over 50 years, we have been trying to accomplish this. And the challenge has been that we do not have very well-targeted therapeutics in this domain. They act generally in neurotransmitter systems, but not on the underlying computational unit of the brain, which is the neural network. And therefore, we are forced to push our doses to very high levels, getting just as many side effects as we do effects. So I want us to continue looking for that miracle pill. But so far, we have not gotten there when it comes to cognition. And I speak very broadly using that term, including mood and emotional regulation. The other problem is that this is a completely non-personalized system. We base our prescriptive advice on large population studies that completely ignore all the individual differences in heterogeneity in those populations. Some practitioners also think of this as a holy grail, that they could use one drug, one intervention to change something as complex as the human brain. And then probably the biggest problem is that it's an open loop system. Long, sloppy, non-quantitative cycles between how we intervene and how we update that intervention. You take a pill home with you from the doctor's office and months pass where you subjectively monitor your effects and side effects go back and then a non-empirical decision is made to go up or down a little bit, right? The art of medicine. And I'd say that this is really just not good enough. These are just too many major fundamental problems that stand in our way of boosting cognition in the year 2016. So we have to look for a new approach that capitalizes on um, potentially technology, and that's what I want to talk about now. I live in San Francisco. We tend to think of technology as the potential solution to everything, and I don't have to tell you about the explosion and the diversity and accessibility of information technology we've seen over the last several decades. I would say that we stand on the verge of a phase shift right now with consumer available virtual reality, augmented reality, wearable physiological devices, motion capture, and artificial intelligence and other machine learning algorithms. Now most of this, the vast majority, is positioned in the consumer space for entertainment, media, and communication. The question is, can we use this technology and existing information technology to improve and enhance our cognitive abilities? And I'd say the answer is yes. And how we can do that on its surface is not all that complicated. It's because with this technology, we can create experience. And experience, as we know, is the gateway to our brain's plasticity. Right? This is the fundamental basis of all learning. 
that experience drives modifications in the brain at every level, its structure, its function, its chemistry, all in response to experience. We know very well how powerful this relationship is. Even witnessing a single tragic event, not just getting shrapnel in your brain, can detrimentally impact the function of your brain for the rest of your life, something we call post-traumatic stress disorder. So our challenge is how do we create or leverage existing technology to maximally harness the brain's plasticity by creating experiences to enhance our cognition, refine our behavior, and at the highest level, to elevate our minds. We can do that through one particular type of experience, I believe, and that's the closed loop system. So I mentioned an open loop system. I just want to spend a moment on this. If you remember anything from this talk, it's the closed loop system. A closed loop is where you intervene in some way and you record, you quant quantify the impact of that intervention, which is with as low latency as possible. So ideally, in real time, you're reading out the impact. You use that data to then update your intervention, to refine it based upon what you're finding, either going a little more or a little less. You apply again, you record, you refine, you cycle over and over at each stage targeting and personalizing. Every engineer knows this is the most powerful way to change any system, whether it be physical or biological. So how do you create closed loop systems using technology? What we do is we create video games, right? A very, very powerful form of interactive media that can involve closed loop systems and is not just a targeted way of creating an experience, but also can be done it adaptively. So it can, it can incorporate closed loops. And it's also fun and engaging, which leads to depth of immersion in play. Here's a little cartoon of how this works. So you're playing a video game, something occurs in your brain, of course. It guides your behavior, which can be recorded by the game as a performance metric, how fast you are, how accurate you are. That data can then be used to feed back an environment that's appropriate. So it could be a challenge that's now scaled to your abilities on day one and as your abilities change over the course of training. So like a personal trainer, every moment just pushing these processes into a more optimal state. We can also give feedback and rewards in real time. And game designers all over the world know that this is how you create deep engagement in gameplay. So this is the core of the system that we think can be used to improve cognition. And we can bring in other modern technology, for example, motion capture and physiological devices that are wearable can learn more about you in the moment and then feed that data into the game engine. So the game now has a more comprehensive view of how you are in that moment, and we could feed back richer environments using tools like augmented and virtual reality. And then we could wrap this all together with artificial intelligence algorithms to create a truly integrated multimodal closed loop system. And I believe that this is the future of how we optimize cognition in those of us that are healthy and those of us that are suffering deficits. So let's make this a little less abstract. Um, eight years ago, I asked myself this question in my lab. Could we build a custom designed video game using closed loop algorithms to enhance cognitive control abilities in older adults? Cognitive control abilities are a set of skills that we have that allow us to interact in this complex world that we live in. Attention, our ability to direct our limited cognitive resources in space and time. Working memory, holding that information in mind to guide our behavior. And goal management, such as task switching and multitasking when you have more than one goal. And we showed that all of these abilities are very sensitive to interference by distraction and multitasking degrades attention and working memory. And we showed all of this gets worse as we get older. I actually have a book just came out called The Distracted Mind, Ancient Brains in a High-Tech World, where I basically tell all the details of this story, which was the focus of our research for over a decade. And we have a signing later at noon if you're interested in this topic. But this was really a jumping off point for what I want to share with you in more detail. After having told this story for so long, it was just fr it's a frustrating story. It's not a happy ending. And I asked the question, could we challenge older adults using this video game in one domain, goal management, multitasking particularly, and see a benefit in attention and working memory? And the hypothesis was generated because we know through a lot of research that these abilities are mechanistic re mechanistically related to each other through a common underlying neural network. And so I reached out to friends of mine I work for a game company in San Francisco called LucasArts, and I asked if they would help develop a game that I designed called NeuroRacer, which challenges 
people, in our case older adults, in a closed loop fashion to multitask, to drive a car while responding to signs. Every time you get a little better, the road goes a little faster, your window to respond to a, su a sign successfully gets a little smaller. And then we did three years of research after a year of development. Just one quick data slide, there's a whole lot in this paper, but what we found, if you're looking on your left side, is a 20-year-old multitasking, red being multitasking you know, at the highest level. That means you suffer no decrement in two tasks versus one task. And what we find, looking across the lifespan, is that, first of all, 20-year-olds have a 30% uh, decrement in their abilities when multitasking, despite the fact that 20-year-olds, at least in San Francisco, believe firmly that they are multitasking masters. Um, that's not an ability that you maintain your entire life just to plummet in one tragic year when you're 69. You plummet every tragic year of your life, as you could see here. And so this is a decline in performance across our life. I'd say aging process in this domain really begins after 23 years old. And we also challenged our game designers to create a game that we could record brain activity during gameplay. And what we show is that the decrement that we see in older adults performing Neuroracer is that they are not engaging their prefrontal cortex, the most evolved part of the brain, as robustly as younger adults. Then we had them play the closed loop version of this game for 12 hours over the course of a month. One hour a day, three days a week for four weeks. And the first thing we found was that they remarkably improved their ability to play the game and multitask on the game. And also showed that they reverted that brain network to a younger uh, pattern of activity. But the most important thing was that we confirmed the hypothesis. They did better on tasks that they were not trained on that were tested with different outcome measures. They had better working memory for faces, and they showed better sustained attention abilities. That's really what we're looking for, that transfer across tasks, as well as sustainability of the multitasking improvement um, six months later. We published that paper at the end of 2013 in this journal, Nature, which is, you know, for a scientist, as good as it gets. And you could see we had this wonderful pun that Nature used. Every laboratory in the world wants uh, the pun of game changer used on the cover of Nature for their paper. And I really bring that up because it has tortured me for years. And it's because it forces me to message that this particular game, as excited about what we accomplished over the five years with it, we don't know if it's a game changer, and maybe it will be, maybe it won't, but what I hope is a game changer is the methodology, that a group of scientists could work carefully with a group of professionals from another industry, in this case the world of video games, to create something that neither group can do on their own, and then to do a very careful, well-controlled, uh, with placebo design study, randomized, to, and neural met metrics to look at outcomes to understand how a game could impact someone in a meaningful, sustainable way. Who does it work best in? It's this type of methodology that we need to encourage. If we don't do this, we will never move something from the entertainment world into the world of medicine and even education. So I hope we see more of that. In the meanwhile, I recognize that I did not want this game to live and die as a research experiment. I wanted it to move into the real world. And what became increasingly obvious was that you can't really build a product in an academic research lab. You could build a prototype, you could do an experiment, but if you want something that really could scale and reach people's lives, this is where you have to work on that delicate relationship between academics and industry. And so I formed a company called Achille, which is part based right here in Boston, part based in San Francisco, with uh, folks from the healthcare industry as well as the video game um, uh, professionals that we work with from LucasArts. And um, we created this company, Achille, which has taken the intellectual property behind Neuroracer and, and built a much get better game that you're looking at here called Evo. Um, so if you want a game to be played by more than young boys and doesn't have violence in it, you need to bring on high levels of art, music, and story. We use the um, tablet so we have nice accelerometry and it's easier to, to manipulate the game. We use the cloud for both server support and analytics. And so bring in on very high technology uh, influences to create a game. Now I could tell you, what we've done with this game is actually interestingly polarizing. This game is not available on the App Store right now. It's not in the consumer domain. We decided to push this as a complete healthcare product, what we think of as a new form of digital medicine. So there are multiple clinical trials now ongoing, both using this as a diagnostic tool and as a therapeutic. Populations such as autism, depression, ADHD, post-traumatic stress disorder, early Alzheimer's disease, multiple sclerosis just started, and more on the way. And so right now we have the first ever FDA trial launched earlier this year to see if this game can be a prescribable treatment for children with uh, ADHD. 
So we'll know as soon as next year whether we're reaching those endpoints. So I think it's an exciting time to think about another player in the medicine uh, that we use to treat uh, uh, mental health and improving cognition. But uh, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll stay tuned for the results on that. In the meanwhile, we wanted to advance our research and go back to incubating new technologies. We formed this lab called Neuroscape at UCSF. It's a new center there. And I just have a quick picture to show you what the lab, I think, of the future will look like. We continue to evolve this. On the left side in the lower corner is the control room. That's where we present all the new interactive media we, uh, we create in our development studio. And then over here is an experimental lab. So this is where people come in. They engage in our new technology, much of it involving virtual reality and motion, motion capture right now to see how we change people while we challenge them in all of these interesting ways using closed loop systems. We don't have enough time to break down all the new games that we've created and we've been working on for over the last three years. You have not heard about any of these likely or read about them because they are just finishing their design phase. It takes us one to two years to build each game, working with professionals in, in, in the gaming industry and storytellers and artists. And these are four of them that are now completed. I just have a quick snapshot of what they look like and what people look like playing them. Metatrain was a game that was inspired to integrate the principles of concentrative meditation with gameplay of adaptivity and feedback. And so this is a game to teach you to better self-regulate internal distraction. Rhythmicity is a game where uh, that the hypothesis is that if you can become more rhythmic, which relies on anticipation and in timing, you will optimize your brain function and see improvements outside of rhythm. Virtual attention is our first virtual reality game to teach you not just to focus your attention, but to distribute it broadly. And Body Brain Trainer is a game that uses motion capture to challenge you both physically and cognitively in one integrated experience. So while the game is adaptive to how you're performing cognitively, it's also recording your heart rate in real time. And if your heart rate is below a level that was set by a VO2 max that you did before you performed Body Brain Trainer training, then what we do, the game automatically just increases the amplitude of your movements, driving your heart rate up. If your heart rate goes too high, the game titrates it back. So that's an example how we can have multiple closed loops running at the same time. Those operating off of your cognitive performance data and another operating off of your physiology. Now that these games are completed, we do the deepest dive ever into figuring out how they work, who do they work in, um, what type of effects do they have outside of the game. And so before and after you play one of our games, we do MRI to look at structure and function. We do EEG to look at timing and rhythm in the brain. We do, uh, obviously, a vast array of cognitive testing, but now also stress testing, sleep testing, blood work to look at hormones, inflammatory markers, telomere length. Basically, if we believe it can change, we now record it. And although we're excited already by what we're reading out from some of these games, we don't even think the real advances are going to happen in the next two or five years. But when we stop putting all of these games together, something that we think of as neuro crossfit training, and we think that this is where we're going to have real impact, is the synergistic effect across a whole package of games. So I just want to close by looking further into the future. Sort of what I just described to you is our bread and butter of what we work on at Neuroscape. Um, we love video games because they can be used to selectively target and activate neural networks unlike anything we've ever had before in this domain. But we can bring on other tools of neuroscience to sort of reinvent neuromodulation and neurofeedback. But in order to do this, we have to actually know what's going on inside your brain while you're playing one of our games. And so we've been working on a new technology called the glass brain. You could Google this and find out more than I'm going to share with you right now in this short time. But what you're looking at is a combination of an MRI and EEG. We developed this at Neuroscape along with many other partners. And the uh, MRI, you could see the, the purple is the cortex of the brain, the golden fibers of the white matter connecting different brain areas. And then integrated with it is real-time electrical recordings via mobile EEG. And you're looking at different powers in, of, of rhythms in the brain, as well as how different areas are communicating with each other. So within two tenths of a second, we do multiple processing, including multivariate Granger causality, which lets us do computational models of how brain areas and networks are being formed while you're interacting with some type of experience like a video game. So what do we do with this? Well, there are two big pathways. One, we could look at this as a real-time neurodiagnostic approach to understand cognition while it's evolving. And the other is that we could use this therapeutically to ultimately close that loop that I've been talking about. 
On the clinical side, we don't have any examples in that domain, but we have this fun one. So this is Mickey Hart. He's the drummer from The Grateful Dead and a collaborator on our Rhythmicity project. And you can see there, he's wearing a head-mounted head display, that's the Oculus Rift, and 64-channel wireless EG. Now, this stage is so big, you can't see what's, what Mickey's looking at. That would be over here. And he's basically playing a game that we created called Neurodrummer, which is challenging him rhythmically. So he can't see the audience. Sitting on his left is Tim Mullen. He's an engineer in our team. And what he's looking at in virtual reality is Mickey's brain. So that's Mickey's brain over there. He's flying through it live, watching the rhythms unfold while Mickey is in his own world. I think of it as like neuro nested dolls. So Tim is sitting inside Mickey's virtual brain and Mickey's sitting inside in his own virtual training world. You can imagine a future that our therapist is sitting there with a patient and they're inside their brain, they're flying to different areas, the prefrontal cortex looking at different rhythms, and then they have a dashboard where they can challenge them in different ways and see how the brain responds. Is that part of our future? I'm not quite sure, but I find it an interesting one, and it's certainly technically feasible. But where we've been spending most of our time is to use the glass brain to close the loop. So I'm gonna conclude with this one slide where I put it all together and give you this vision of where we hope we are uh, in the future. 2016 right now, you present to your doctor and let's say you're eight or 80 years old and you have an attention problem. You invariably get one of these, which has just the side of, you know, the, the, the issue, and we all know this, is that it's really a sledgehammer. It's affecting your brain too diffusely. We don't necessarily have to get rid of these agents. I think that we could just reduce the dosage to use them as an activator and then use a tool, I didn't actually talk about this, it's an app that we created called ACE, Adaptive Cognitive Evaluation, to understand where someone's brain, an individual's brain, higher order assessment, needs to be challenged. Then we could prescribe a video game or likely a series of video games that challenge those networks. But the games and how the games are delivered are constantly changing using AI so that it's really targeting those networks that most need to be optimized. Then the glass brain comes in. We're working with many companies that allow us to have EEG recordings while you're at home or in classroom or in clinic. And this data that's being generated during gameplay feeds into the game engine. So now the game is not just adaptive and giving feedback based on your performance, how fast or accurate you are based on your heart rate, it's doing it based on what's actually going on inside your brain. We think this will be like a surgical approach, targeting the game engine to those processes that most need to be optimized. We also have experiments to use EEG during gameplay to feed this data into and drive the stimulation parameters of a device like this. This is TACS, transcranial alternating current stimulation. And what it allows us to do is to stimulate the brain electrically at rhythms that match the endogenous rhythms within the brain. And we're already showing, we have a couple papers submitting this year, that we can boost the beneficial effects from video games with this approach. Whether this will lead to greater transfer, greater sustainability, those are research questions. And so what we have here when you put this all together is an approach that's targeted to those networks that most need to be optimized. It's personalized, not just to the individual on day one, but how that person changes over time. And multimodal with multiple closed loops all integrated together. And then because we always favor using consumer technology because it's so accessible, for the first time we're able to do this real world in real time. Get this into people's homes. This is something we always struggle with as physicians, that we see our patients in these very sparse snapshots and in very stressful environments. So this is the goal of what we are trying to create. And over the next 10 years, we will look at how this has an impact across numerous conditions. And we'll do this collaborations with physician scientists. And this is not a wish list. All of these have already begun. And then maybe even a bigger vision is how can this exact same technology have a benefit in the education and wellness domain so it can help improve cognition for everyone. And with that, I'd like to thank you for your attention.